Next up on the Mutual Audio Network, fiction from our future. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. The Leviathan Chronicles Season 2 The story thus far. Oberlin and Tully have been betrayed by Fish Egg Freddy. After lying to the two of them that he had landed a substantial caviar order with a major hotel chain, Freddy invited Oberlin and Tully for a night out on the town to celebrate his success. But after getting his friends drunk at a strip club in Naha City, Freddy called the Yakuza to collect the price that had been placed on Tully's head. 18 months ago, Tully had taken a $250,000 loan from the Yakuza to pay for the Hail Mary and fund his treasure hunting expedition of the Orlando Cortez, a fabled shipwreck containing millions of dollars in silver bullion. But when he failed to repay the loan, the Yakuza threatened Tully with death, leaving him on the run ever since. Both he and Oblin are now in Yakuza custody. Across the Pacific Ocean, Harlequin continues to recover from his injuries in a secret sanctuary installation deep underneath the Las Vegas Strip. His life was saved by his young ward, Lizette Mansabile, who now waits for his health to return. She has been told that their presence in Las Vegas is not a mere coincidence and that they still have a city to save. And back in the high Himalayan mountains, Whit Roberts and Senshin have stolen a Chinese rescue helicopter and are rushing to get back to New York City to rendezvous with Jason Sterling. Sterling now has two prisoners in his custody, young Toshi Tanaka, the son of Nankatsu CEO Kasunori Tanaka, and Rebecca Kinderman, a young librarian from New York. But McAllen also faces the biggest challenge of all. Leviathan City is careening towards chaos as multiple power failures have caused deadly cavern collapses, and the risk is growing that the pressure shield will ultimately fail, thus dooming Leviathan. McAllen has recalled almost all Leviathan citizens from the surface to help stem the destruction within the city. She now commands an elite strike force and is racing across the globe to find the missing Seraxian aliens that she believes will enable her to obtain a Star Stone and save Evangeline and Leviathan. She and her team have reached Iron Gate, a remote black door computer station built on an abandoned offshore oil rig. Mai Lee, an agent of Black Door No. 3, has given McAllen a passcode to obtain the secret information she needs. And now, Chapter 33, Mother Bear. Fire! What's the ascent distance? I'm showing 95 feet from sea level. I'm attaching the ascender. Anton, any change on our scans? Radar and sonar show clear skies and no bogeys. Copy. As soon as we get secure on the platform, I want you to descend 30 meters and hold position. Understood. Under Chief Watson, before we begin, is there any further precaution you'd advise at this time? Only one. Everyone should activate the beacon mode on their PCOM. If we get separated, or if one of us is taken prisoner, we'll be able to pinpoint their location. I was told the station was unmanned. You asked for my advice, Councilwoman. And without another word, military under Chief Watson turned away and started to affix her equipment to the thin steel cable running upward to a high metal landing on Iron Gate. After a moment of awkward silence, the other strike team members clipped into their motorized descenders and quickly rose the length of the grappling hook lines to arrive at a grated access landing towards the top of the facility. After hopping over the metal railing, McAllen turned to look out upon the flashing Pacific Ocean. She could now see miles further out on the ocean, but the featureless view remained the same, just the profound emptiness and beauty of the ocean. It's stunning here. Lonely, but stunning. Don't let the Underchief see you gazing fondly in the distance. She's pretty focused right now, and I think you make her nervous, if you don't mind me saying so. I don't, and thank you, Robertson. And you're right. It is a stunning view. The water never disappoints. Under Chief, I think I've got something. What is it? I think I found an entry point into the interior. Strange. What's wrong? This door into the station. What about it? It has no knob. There is no way to open it from the outside. That is odd. Very, but we need access. Robertson, do you have enough space to use explosives? I don't advise it, ma'am. This platform was used to drill for oil and natural gas. Using firepower should be the last resort. I think I have something that will work. Ah, I brought a ceramic saw. 
Maybe this can loosen the door enough that we can take it off the hinges. Try it. We're exposed out here. How long will this take, Gregor? The steel door's pretty thick. I think after 20 minutes we should have a pretty good... Maybe you just don't know your own strength? Sadly, I'm very much aware of my own strength. That seemed a little too easy. Oh. Stale air flowed outward while the strike force peered inside the jagged doorway into the dark chamber inside. Oh. Dusty office furniture was strewn haphazardly on the floor, and a few folding tables held aging computers on top of them. Rusted metal cabinets stood in the corners, some open, some closed. Further inside, McAllen could just make out the outline of another doorway inside. I'll take point. Robertson, you're with me. Gregor, cover the rear. Under Chief Watson paused for a moment and stared at her PCOM. Anton, this is Watson. Do your scans still show clear? Nothing in scanners, Under Chief. I'll alert you with any change in status. See you do that. Ready? In. Keitha Watson shot into the darkened room, sweeping left the barrel of her modified Colt subcompact right rifle clear. across the left Door side of the chamber, while Robertson covered the right. Go, go, Each go. of them kicked over the office chairs laying on the ground, and shone their head torches beneath the filthy desks to detect any enemy combatants. McCallum followed quickly behind while Gregor protected the rear. The first room was empty. Next room! Robertson fired a massive kick to the office door, blowing it off its hinges. The strike force followed quickly behind into another room containing similar discarded office furniture with outdated computers. The light from outside now barely illuminated the chamber this deep into Iron Gate. Gregor, I want lights. On it. The room's clear, ma'am. There's a freight elevator off to the right, but without power. I don't think it's going to do us much good. There's got to be a backup staircase somewhere. I mean, the elevator must get stuck and they... I think I found the master power relay. Hit it. Flickering fluorescent lamps sputtered and finally kicked on. However, only two of the five ceiling mounted lights stayed on, while the rest just popped back and forth into darkness. Nonetheless, McCallum could now fully assess the chamber within the ore rig that she and her team were standing in. The room appeared to be a control center and monitor station for the drilling that went on below the ocean. As Robertson stated, a freight elevator was positioned off to the rear right. From the state of the room and the thick dust that covered the computer keyboards, the facility hadn't been used in years. Where's all the workers for this oil rig? We know it's not really an oil rig. At least not anymore. If Black Door is hiding something so valuable here, why isn't there more security? I think being in the middle of the North Pacific is reasonably secure. Something's not right here. What do you mean? Look at the computers. Do you notice anything? They're ancient. They look like maybe 15 or 20 years old. No. No, there's something else. Something's wrong here. McAllen slowly circled the room, letting her finger drag on the dusty surface of the metal cabinet. She paused and then pulled one of the chairs out from under the desk and quietly sat down and waited for the room to reveal itself. What are you doing, McAllen? Shh. McAllen! It's the computers. We know. They're antiquated. So what does... They're props. Look, none of the computers have power cords. They, they can't be turned on. This whole room is a stage. It's a diversion. What is it we're being diverted from? Whoever designed this place wants us distracted. The strike force stared at each other before Under Chief Watson brought her wrist to her mouth, activating her PCOM. Anton, this is Watson. What is your status? Is the perimeter still clear? I'm maintaining depth of 30 feet. There's no signs of any activity on so The coast is still clear, Under Chief. That's a lot of distortion. Our PCOMs operate on a high energy carrier wave that should give us miles of range. Anton is just a few hundred yards away. Could be a jamming system in place, or... Or there's some sort of shielding protecting this facility. Whatever it is, we're going to be on our own in here. Tell me again what we're looking for, McAllen. My Lee said there was some sort of server here. Something that had a record of the activity of the divisions within Black Door. Apparently each door has a special safe house, a place they can retreat to when threatened. If we can analyze the activity of door number 12, then maybe we can find their safe house. And that is where I'm betting we'll find the aliens. But like you said, all the computers we've seen here are dummies. I mean, they're not even turned on. That's because it's a ruse, because we probably haven't found the real part of the station yet. You think about it. Silence fell over the room. For me, this is very simple. McAllen has said she trusted my Lee. And since we've all placed it our trust in your judgment, Councilwoman, I say we keep looking. Something has to be here, doesn't it? It does. McAllen stared back at Under Chief Watson. Gregor, check the elevator. One second. It looks like it's now operational. It goes down three floors. Then it looks like we're going down. The 
Because of the alcohol made any attempt at discerning direction futile, Tully and Oberlin sat in the back of a black Lexus LX SUV as it wound through the tight streets of Naha City. One of the Yakuza gangsters that picked them up sat next to them in the back seat, while the other two sat in the front. It was a tight fit owing to the size of the Japanese men, leaving the inside of the car feeling humidly warm with perspiration. The rocking motion of the car was starting to make Oberlin feel sick. He could still taste the tequila that one of the strippers had been serving him. Tully, on the other hand, was still slightly drunk from doing Jägermeister shots with Fish Egg Freddy, the man he used to think was his friend, the man that had turned the two of them in. Fucking Freddy. Cheap fucking piece of slime. How could you just roll on us? Just to get a get a damn payday. I'm supposed to be worth more than worth that. something. I'll get you back to this you motherfucker. He then realized that the odds of him ever seeing Fish Egg Freddy or McAllen or anybody else he cared about were very slim. His head sank down in exhaustion. Hey. Hey, Hoblin, do you think no that... No talking. The SUV led them into a neon-clad building just outside Naha's main shopping district. There was no pushing or signs of physical intimidation as the gangsters walked Tully and Oberlin through the storefront of a dingy electronics store and down several sets of stairs in the rear. The manager behind the counter failed to even raise his head as they proceeded through. The men marched slowly, if not completely, in a straight line. Lingering inebriation, nausea and fatigue were taking their toll on Tully, as did his sense of fatal resignation. They got me. They fucking got me. I really thought we were gonna pull through. I really thought we had a chance. Wait here. At the bottom of the stairs was an oversized metal door with two thick deadbolts and steel reinforced hinges. One of the men pushed the heavy door open slightly and slipped inside the room, while Tully and Oberlin stood outside with the other two Yakuza members. Tully was now slumped against one of the walls, and neither Yakuza member attempted to steady him. Oberlin's head was throbbing with pain as his hangover and overwhelming sense of dread began to set in. Tully? Brother, are you okay? The deadbolt snapped back, and the door to the next room was slowly pulled open. As Tully and Oberlin were pushed forward into the next chamber, they could feel the stifling heat from the hot water pipes overhead. Two metal chairs facing each other were bolted to the concrete floor. A single floor drain lay between the chairs, covered in dark brown residue. Oberlin's spine stiffened and vomit began to rise in his mouth. He knew what this room was. He had been in rooms like this. This was a room for torture. Oberlin and Tully were roughly pushed into their chairs before one of the Yakuza took several sets of steel handcuffs and fastened them tightly to their arms and legs, biting into their skin. And then, without another word, all the men in the room turned and walked out, leaving Tully and Oberlin alone, facing each other for over three hours. I can't feel my hands, Tully. Hey, don't talk, buddy. If they hear us, they're only going to make it worse. Worse? Jesus, look at him. What the hell did I do to this guy? My best friend. Look at the lines around his mouth and under his eyes. Poor guy should have never met me. If only I had... The heavy metal door opened, and a slender Asian man in an elegant black suit walked into the room. Several men stood respectfully behind the man carrying photography equipment and video cameras. The well-dressed man walked in the middle of the room to stare at both Tully and Oberlin. My name is Kasunori Tanaka, and I am here to make an example of you. Dark. Skin the shows this section has power. Robertson, get the lights. What is this place? Oh, what is that smell? It looks like some sort of mess hall or wreck area for the crew of a station. I thought there wasn't supposed to be a crew. The four strike team members exited the freight elevator and stepped out into a large dining hall populated by six long rows of tables and chairs. A ping-pong table and a foosball table lay off to the right, with an entrance to the cafeteria to the left. Seems like someone is going to a lot of effort to make this place seem like something it's not. Yeah, right down to the rotten food. Jesus, whatever spoiled stinks to high heaven. That isn't food. Men, keep your spear sharp and let's fan out. Robertson walked down the right aisle, while Gregor took the left. McAllen and Watson took the center. The underchief took a few cautious steps forward, then stopped. You got something, Lieutenant? Just a hunch. How much ammo did you bring? Enough to bring down the country. Keep it handy. McCallum. What? Tell me why you trust her. Who? My Lee. Her father, Dr. Tang Sui, loved Leviathan and spent many years down there. It makes sense that she would want to honor her dead father's desire by trying to help save our city. Any daughter would. What would you know about being a daughter? Under Chief, I think I found something. You should see this. 
The strike force converged on Robertson's position and saw three bodies in advanced stages of decomposition laying on the floor. The revolting putrid smell was now so overwhelming that even Under Chief Watson struggled to avoid vomiting. What the fuck is this? Who were these people? Their outfits resemble special forces. Flat jackets, taser. <laughs> Holy shit. What? Look at the hand. The strike force turned its attention down to one of the cadaver's exposed hands. The skin was mostly peeled backwards, and the exposed bone seemed thin and small, protruding from the bulk of its tactical clothing. But the grotesque appearance and stench of the corpse was not what brought the team to silence. McAllen's medical experience finally kicked in, and she brought the neck of the long-sleeved t-shirt over her nose and mouth and bent closer to the nearest body. Upon closer inspection, she could see that many of the person's bones in their hand were not white, but rather constructed of a clear acrylic polymer. In fact, it appeared that most of the material making up the radial ulna and wrist bones was constructed of shimmering glass. What is that on their skeleton? It's plasmium. It's a bone replacement material that's stronger than tungsten and non-reactive to the human body's immune system. I've never heard of it. That's because mankind hasn't invented it yet. McAllen stood and faced under Chief Watson. This one's immortal, McAllen. Were, were they Edeners or part of the rebellion? Under Chief Watson squinted her eyes and stared at the disfigured, withered faces of the decomposed bodies that were now unrecognizable. I don't know, McAllen. Why don't you ask them? Riginski, give me another set of proximity sensors covering our perimeter and arm them with cesium grenades. Under Chief, given the combustible nature of this facility, I don't recommend it. Relax, that we... Robertson. I think we've got bigger issues than lighting a match at a gas station. This entire oil rig is a ruse. Whoever killed these people is our real threat. This entire infiltration's been too easy. Now's not the time to play it safe. As much as McAllen despised the Underchief, she could see the wisdom in the woman's words. Keitha Watson was a damn good military strategist. Gregor Roginski reached into his seemingly bottomless black satchel and removed three motion sensor detonators and placed them near the elevator that brought them down, as well as the far and near walls. The direction of their body seems to indicate that they were trying to get to something. Or away from something. McAllen looked across the room and could see a straight line between the bodies and the entrance to the cafeteria. She walked over to the area displaying silverware and dining trays. In the back of the kitchen, she could see a meat locker with the door swung wide open. She looked down towards the ground and could see a long row of white plates on the floor, shattered. Whoever they were, they came this way in a hurry. They were searching for something that was inside this chamber, inside the kitchen. If there was something inside here worth killing them for, then that's exactly where we need to go. Come on. In here. The strike force shone its flashlights inside the dark meat locker. Ironically, the smell inside the freezer was an improvement over the dining hall. Large puddles of water spread across the floor as the coolant system continued to pump cold air into the unlocked room. Look in the back. McAllen and Robertson pushed aside carcasses of rotting meat that hung from the ceiling. In the back of the room was another steel door. There were scattered wooden crates and cardboard boxes strewn around the door, as well as a broken combination lock. They were using these crates to hide the door. Doesn't look like they were hiding much, and why would they guard the entrance to the server with a hardware store combination lock? Because the real security is in here. Robertson used the barrel of his rifle to slowly push open the heavy metal door. The lock protecting it was smashed and lay on the ground, but opening the door revealed another door inside, a very different door. Well, looky here. Bingo. Riginski, what have we got? The second inner door resembled a heavy barrier in a high-tech bank vault. The door gleamed in thick stainless steel and was ribbed with reinforcing titanium and iron. A thick electronic keypad with a biometric scanner was once attached to the right side of the door, but the interface was now ripped from its casing in the wall and hung down by several thick electrical cables. Attached to the biometric scanner was a small box of gleaming green glass that pulsed rhythmically. A skeleton box. There's nothing to code here, Dr. Chief. This lock has been picked. Someone has already been here. The door is wide open. The strike force entered the inner doorway and saw a modern freight elevator stationed beside a set of corrugated metal stairs leading further downward into the bowels of Iron Gate. I say we take the stairs. Agreed. I'll take point. I'm picking up significant increases in electrical activity below us. The server. The team descended down further into the bowels of Iron Gate. 
The rooms that the team passed through were now vastly different from the dilapidated offices and rusty control centers of the oil rig above. They passed through several chambers that included a satellite recon monitoring station, a conference room with several detailed maps of Russia, China and Antarctica, and a macabre laboratory with several racks of test tubes, refrigerated solutions and hypodermic needles. One video screen beside the lab table looked down on an empty, damp room with a single metal chair in the center. Eventually, the string of rooms terminated at the largest chamber, a circular room with a deep, sunken center. In the center of the chamber were two thick, circular plexiglass barriers that rotated in opposite directions. Each barrier had a small opening that, if aligned, would allow access to the interior, which contained a single standing monitor and keyboard. That's it! It's the Black Door server! How do you know? Because it would be located in the most protected part of the station. Even if there was an aerial attack or a rogue tsunami that destroyed the upper part, the exposed part of the station. We're now located in one of the lower support pillars, which would remain unfazed. We're under the waterline now. It's where I would hide something if I didn't want anyone else to find it. I don't like the setup. It's dangerous. Robertson. Watson, you're with me. Gregor, I want you to lay another round of proximity sensors around the stairs and laboratory. Once we've got a protective perimeter, rendezvous back with us in the server chamber, but stay on the outside of the barrier. Let's bring all weapons to hot and stay focused. Miley provided us with access codes to bypass any security measures, but keep your eyes peeled for any other monitoring or surveillance systems that might be in place. Got it? Yes, ma'am. Got it. McAllen, Robertson, and Under Chief Watson walked down a few more steps to get closer to the rotating barriers, which stood over 13 feet high. A silver metal plate was affixed to the floor. McAllen stared at Robertson before stepping on top of it. As soon as McAllen stepped on the plate, the two spinning barriers quickly accelerated before slowing to a stop, allowing the two openings to now align themselves, thus allowing entry into the center. We're in. Robertson and Watson followed McAllen into the center, where she approached the keyboard to access the server. As soon as the team entered the center, the two thick plexiglass barriers began spinning, preventing any egress from the interior. Gregor Roginski bounced back to the large server chamber and stared at the team from outside the clear barrier. Defensive perimeter established. What are you seeing on the screen, McAllen? Black door logo, current activity... Field work. I'm now seeing several directories. How many? Twenty. Bingo. You found it, McAllen. Anton, can you still read us? Let's hurry, get what we need, and get the hell out of here. I'm going to try to access the 12th directory. Is it giving you access? No. No, it isn't. It's prompting me for the access code. Are you sure you know the exact code, McAllen? Miley told me. And what is the code? Mother Bear. The room fell silent as McAllen typed the access code into the prompt on the server and waited. What's it doing? Do we have access? I... I'm not sure it... The other members of the strike force all converged around McAllen to look at the server monitor that was now spitting out rows and rows of numbers and codes. The screen flashed white for a moment and then fell dark. What the hell? It's a map. It's zooming in on the location. A black door safe house. It's honing in on the west coast. Panning north to the Pacific Northwest. There's some remote regions of the Cascade Mountains. Wait, no. It's moving offshore. Some sort of ship, maybe that's stationed on... Going further north. No, no. It's got to be in close proximity to our location. If... Fuck. The screen zoomed in further on a small grey speck surrounded by the flashing blue sea of the Gulf of Alaska. The speck widened until a metal superstructure could be seen, and soon a small heliport and loading crane could be discerned from the growing image on the monitor. It's Iron Gate. This place is the safe house? It's not a safe house. No, no, no! Missile lock confirmed. The server monitor tinted red as a target crosshair formed over the image of Iron Gate. Rows of numbers, trajectories, and headings scrolled furiously down the screen. She double-crossed us. Robertson, get us out of here, now! Everyone, fuck! With one powerful sweep of his arm, Robertson threw Watson and McAllen to the ground as he shouldered the massive rifle he carried and unloaded the HMX projectiles from the wide center barrels of his gun. Shattering the thick walls into burned, smoking shards. Move! Now! Uh. 
In a split second, everything in the world shifted and no longer made sense to McCallan Orsall. As one of the four massive pillars supporting the Iron Gate Ulrich gave way, the floor that had been under McCallan suddenly shifted upwards violently, and all the walls and doors she viewed now lurched forcefully to the side, throwing her into one of the sharp shards of the plexiglass barrier. Fires now erupted everywhere. Watson grabbed her and quickly got her head under McCallan's arm for support, pushing her forward. The stairs! Get to the stairs! Robertson immediately took point and began sprinting up the stairs. Gregor limped behind them, bleeding from his head. Come on, come on! Another explosion rocked the station, sending debris flying everywhere. Robertson! One of the steel girders collapsed from the roof and smashed through the staircase, creating a ten-foot gap between Robertson and the rest of the team. They were separated and trapped. Jump! I'll catch you! Keitha Watson took three steps back and exploded up the remaining steps, <laughs> leaping over 15 feet and landing beside Robertson. McCowan jumped forward but landed directly on the same ledge Robertson was standing on. The abrupt stop in her momentum pushed her backwards, causing her to fall back into the growing fire below. I got you, McCowan. Robertson's hand snatched her belt buckle. He pushed her aside and turned his attention to the last member of the strike force. Come on, Gregor. Jump now, But the head injury he sustained was clearly taking its effect on Gregor. He squinted his eyes for a moment. It looked like he had trouble seeing the staircase. With the heat of the fires now stinging the backs of his legs, he began a clumsy run forward and leapt a few feet too early. He's not going to make it! But before he could plummet into the flames below, Robertson again shot his right hand out while his left anchored him to the wall. Not today, my friend. Robertson grabbed Roginsky by his chest straps and with one hand lifted yeah. him overhead, crashing down beside Watson and McCallan. We've got to get out of here. Get back to the ship. Anton, do you read me? Anton, come in! The team sprinted up the remaining steps to get back to the meat locker of the dining hall. The oil rig continued to collapse around them as explosions shuddered the floor they were standing on. We need to get to the elevator. But before McCallan could move, the entire team was suddenly brought to their knees, clutching their faces in pain as it felt like burning acid had been sprayed over their eyes. Some sort of gym gas! We can't see! Robertson, make us a hole now! We've got to get out of here before we get blinded! The walls are too thick, man! I don't have enough firepower to break through! Proximity bombers! By the dining hall! Aim for the bombs, Robertson! On it! Hurry! The wretched gas stung Robertson's eyes so sharply that it was nearly impossible to line up a clean shot. I, I can't see it! Take the shot! As the station tilted hard to the left, three of the proximity bombs laid down by Roginsky now tumbled into each other. The HMX grenade launcher from Robertson's minigun let two massive rounds loose, but they deployed too far away to detonate the proximity bombs. But as soon as Robertson sprayed the area down with 50 caliber ammunition, the bombs exploded blowing a gargantuan hole into the side of Iron Gate and sending huge chunks of the oil rig hurling outwards to the Pacific Ocean. Sunlight now streamed into the dining hall and fresh sea air was now venting the toxic gas outwards, but any relief was quickly short-lived. The floor behind the cannon started to rise higher again as the oil rig lurched forward, plunging closer to the sea. We're losing the station! We're going down! For God's sakes, run for it! We'll be trapped! Out! Everybody out! Head for the opening! It's our only chance! Gregor, can you make it? Look! I'll be behind you. Robertson dropped his enormous gun for the first time since entering the station and ran towards the gaping hole, leaping forward and hurling his body out from the station and down over a hundred feet. Gregor followed behind him but staggered in his run. He couldn't clear the distance that Robertson made and it looked like some of the crumbling station might fall on top of him when he struck the water. Go, McCallum! You go first, Watson! Get out of this damn station now and that's a fucking order! As McCallum steadied herself to sprint towards the gaping hole in the wall, she could peer through the jagged gap and see the brilliant sunlight bursting out of the blue sky above the ocean and streaming into the chaos inside. She ran for her life, barely registering the F-22 Raptor that was now in final approach and firing its last air-to-surface missile that would incinerate what remained of Iron Age. Eagle 6 on final approach. Target acquired. Firing last arrow. listening to season two of the Leviathan Chronicles by Christoph Leputka. To listen to the entire first half of season two right now and get exclusive storyline, purchase the director's cut of season two at leviathanchronicles.com. 
For more updates and news, find us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for supporting us, and thank you for listening. You're listening to Wednesday Wonders on the Mutual Audio Network, where you can enjoy the wonders of the imagination. And speaking of wonders, everybody wonders why the Bells in the Bat Free podcast is still plugging along, not only on Friday Follies, but a bunch of times on Sunday Showcase as well. Give Bells in the Bat Free a listen sometime, and you'll wonder how he gets away with some of that stuff. Rated G, family friendly. Caution, occasional toxic puns.